It always seems impossible until it's done. Inspired by that quote, I've written about the force that I believe Nelson Mandela was in prison for fighting, or twin forces, imperialism and white supremacy. So here it goes. It's often said that history is written by the winners. I am not so convinced. Whilst I don't dispute that uncountable people claiming to be historians have been educated in the sport of praising the powerful and don't doubt the effect that dominant ideas, however false, have on human beings, it still seems to me that it's people, everyday people, not academics or the mass media, that have the final say in this thing that we call history. While the wealth of kings and the rule of the powerful continue to fill school curricula the planet over, the combined actions of ordinary people have altered the ways in which power is forced to work are all too often ignored, indeed, functionally so. This induced historical ignorance serves the twin purposes of reinforcing the image of the all-powerful and paralyzing those who would dare to dream that a different world is possible. Thankfully, people's histories, that is histories told from the perspectives of everyday citizens, have emerged to combat the dusty lists of monarchs and their invasions. It is in these, the works of these historians that will find a more accurate picture of how challenges to power have shaped power and forced unjust power to bend, if not, unfortunately, to crack totally. The anti-colonial struggles of the so-called Third World and their successes in ending direct European colonial rule in the decades immediately following World War II is one such process and was arguably the most significant change in world affairs in the 20th century, though you'd never know that examining any mainstream histories of the period. Countless individuals gave their lives, energies, and their bodily safety to end in what was in many cases centuries of dictatorial imperial rule. However, Western imperial power was not broken by these forces, and the naked colonialism of pre-1945 has been replaced by what Kwame Nkrumah called neo-colonialism. One of the strangest sadistic twists of this asymmetric relationship was seen in the fact that many countries that sent troops to fight for the liberation of their colonizers from Nazi aggression were then reinvaded by their former comrades when they demanded the same freedoms, such as Kenya with Britain or Vietnam by France, for example. Yet somehow, the cheerleaders of empire have managed to continue to mask this genocidal reign of some kind of civilizing mission in the public imagination. It is within this context of cosmic scale violence that we must place South Africa's quest and eventual success in defeating former white supremacy, alias apartheid, the last bastion of direct European colonial rule. It is also against the general neo-colonial trend that we can examine what is left to do globally and in South Africa in particular. For those of us that believe in justice, sadly the news is not always good. You will hear it said, hear it repeated, Nelson Mandela spent 27 years in prison a lifetime of personal sacrifice that we, in comfortable chairs, can barely fathom. If a news report is even particularly radical, they may even speak of the torture and violence of apartheid, but rarely, if ever, is the system that this brutality, including the imprisonment of people like Mandela, served, mentioned, let alone analyzed. You'd almost be forgiven for thinking nobody benefited from apartheid. Of course, this is simply not the case. And much like its transatlantic cousin, Apartheid slavery used racism, or to put it more accurately, the mythology of innate white superiority, to justify treating a huge black workforce in ways that would make a human shudder to treat cattle. With no rural rights, no freedoms to travel in their own country, and no recourse to the law with respect to the abuses of their enslavers. This explo exploited black labor force, along with the fantastic mineral wealth of Southern Africa, produced uncountable fortunes for white-owned corporations and some of the general highest living standards in the world for most white South Africans. British companies were the primary investor in this system, lest we forget. The governments of Britain and America, ever eager to pass sanctions on regimes they deemed dictatorial, such as Zimbabwe or Cuba, did not bow to international pressure to pass sanctions on white supremacist South Africa lest we forget. Given a basic understanding of white supremacy's economic underpinnings and its service to capitalism, it would not be unreasonable to ask if that economic relationship between black and white, between large transnational corporations and black labor was radically changed by the political freedom of black South Africans. If apartheid was primarily an economic system, to claim as we do that apartheid has ended, there must then by inference be something resembling economic democracy occurring over there in Southern Africa. Back to Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela, as we know, as we've said, was in prison for almost as long as I've been breathing. 
27 long years of labour, of concrete floors, of beatings, of everything that one can imagine goes on in apartheid jail cells. His and the ANC's choice to abandon the Freedom Charter must be placed within the brutal realities of world politics. That is not to say that anyone, even Nelson Mandela, cannot be criticised, but one must be careful when viewing someone else's revolution from the comfortable seats at the back of the cinema, as we are here. So when we point out the basic facts, it's not out of a presumption that we are too capable of such enormous personal sacrifice or to poo-poo what has been achieved. It's just out of a recognition of reality. The Freedom Charter has not been fulfilled. The note Nelson Mandela wrote from prison in 1990 restating his commitment to the nationalization of certain sectors of the South African economy, most notably banking and mining, has not been anywhere near close to delivered upon. To understand why, we must look a little closer at what actually was agreed during the apartheid handover. After the apartheid handover, it was agreed that the South African Central Bank would become virtually an independent entity, unaccountable to the elected government, and run by the same man it was run by under apartheid, Chris Stools. Derek Keyes, apartheid finance minister, also kept his position. Massive pensions were paid out to former apartheid civil personnel, and not one single corporation was forced to pay reparations to the victims of murders and other abuses carried out under apartheid to benefit them. Even the debt incurred by the dictatorial apartheid regime had to be surfaced, serviced by the newly elected ANC to the tune of 4.5 billion US dollars per year. This would be laughable if it was not so sickening. A newly elected black government agreeing to pay back loans taken out with international creditors by a white supremacist regime. There is here one of the clearest legal cases for odious debt anywhere in the world. But no doubt, well aware of the constant threat of capital flight and other economic weapons wielded by the international community, defaulting on the debts of their oppressors has been something the ANC has chosen not to do. In addition, Post-apartheid South Africa had to re repay these debts of the apartheid regime at a significantly higher rate than the UK or even post-Nazi Germany were asked to repay their debts from World War II. Pause on that. Reflecting the general trend of unequal treatment of poor countries by international creditors. To this day, whites, who are just 10% of the South African population, continue to control the overwhelming majority of the land and almost all of the attendant wealth extracted from it. Rapists and killers were not imprisoned, as would be the usual fashion, but were rather were invited to confess their crimes and walk free during a process named Truth and Reconciliation. This was not justice. This simply was not the end of apartheid, but rather it's morphing from a system that was unapologetically racist to one that is now, like the rest of the globe, unapologetically economically unjust and by logical product of South Africa's and the world's history, still racist, if not explicitly, but implicitly. This legacy has led us to the Lonmin massacre of the 16th of August 2012 at Makinara, where 34 striking miners were shot dead by the South African police force, the single largest public execution in South Africa since the infamous Sharpeville massacre. In post-apartheid South Africa, the message is still clear, that black life is expendable in the pursuit of white profit. Again, I must restate, because I don't want what I'm saying to be deliberately misused, the ending of political apartheid is to be celebrated. Majority rule, however flawed, is always preferable to racist minority rule. And the ANC have made some very positive geopolitical moves that we know their racist predecessor government would not, would not have made, such as refusing Britain's overtures to help this nation invade Zimbabwe and being the only government to send arms to the democratically elected Lavalas party in Haiti whilst their democracy was being destroyed by Haitian elites and their United States backers. Nonetheless, the fact simply is that apartheid did not end. It was altered, but not shattered. The public spirit of triumphalism that was attendant at the ending of apartheid, along with the reality of continued oppression for those with whom we claim solidarity, has obvious historical parallels. When transatlantic slavery ended, for example, in the US, in the British and other European colonies, Africans were given non-economic emancipation i.e. no compensation and no tools from which to build the fabric of a new life. In fact, in Britain's colonies, it was the slave owners who were compensated by the British government to the tune of £20 million in 1807 for the loss of their property. 
Even after Haiti had won its independence by staging the first successful slave revolution in human history, defeating the armies of France, Spain, and England, the French in 1825, under the threat of reinvasion, managed to extort 91 million francs for their loss of property from the newly independent nation of their former slaves. Generations of Haitians labored to pay back this debt up until 1947. The point is that these abuses are endemic to, rather than abhorrences within capitalism, and you don't have to be a Marxist to see that. When the luxuries of private individuals are put before the basic necessities of millions, it gives us such enlightening historical events as King Leopold's reign in the Congo, where a piece of land 80 times the size of Belgium could be awarded to one man by the governments of Europe and America, and subsequently 10 million humans could be killed to generate fantastic private wealth for that one Belgian man. The fact that he had the cheek to call his possession the Congo Free State only reveals the sadistic, comedic tastes of imperialists. The Congo is still blighted by violence to this day, and the execution of its first democratically elected leader with the active connivance of Western intelligence agencies has played no small role in the ensuing tragedy. A system that privileges individual luxury over the basic needs of billions has brought us to a place where over a billion people in this modern, developed world do not have access to the basics of life, not by accident, but by design. Where one American man has as much wealth as 150 million of his national compatriots, and where many of the largest economies on the planet are private companies, not countries. Of course, anyone who dares to publicly question a system that has produced such mind-numbing injustice is dismissed as a utopian communist fairy hell-bent on destroying the free market. <laughs> free for whom and to do what exactly, one might ask. Today, the neo-colonialism Kwame Nkrumah predicted has the so-called third world literally paying for the lifestyles of billionaires. For example, Susan George in her 1992 book, Debt Boomerang, how third world debt harms us all, calculated that a net of $418 billion of borrowed funds flowed right back north between 1982 and 1990. This is more than double what was spent to rebuild Europe after World War II. Add to that the fact of structural adjustment, where unelected institutions such as the IMF and the World Bank, both US controlled, make it a policy to force poor countries to cut back spendings on health, education, water supplies, and to often privatize these very essentials as part of this repayment. This is to say nothing of the unimaginable tonnage of mineral wealth sucked out of the third world each day at bargain basement prices thanks to commodity cartels and currency fluctuations. Yet we ask ourselves in all sincerity, why is the third world still poor? Or even worse, feign charity towards them, the poor, teeming, brown and black masses who can't quite figure out how to feed their children. We could ask, why don't poor nations just default on these loans, seeing as these neo-colonial debts of their former oppressors are literally killing millions of people a year and represent only 1% of global debt anyway? The answer is multifaceted. First, and most obvious, being that the global south is not free of class division, and a great many of the rich in India, in Nigeria, in Jamaica and such, really just don't care what happens to poor people in their nations. Many of these people benefit directly from this scenario. They are its accomplices. But more scary than this, predictable greed, is the frequency with which leaders, in many cases democratically elected, have been ousted or killed with the admitted connivance of the military might of the United States and its allies over the last half a century. It is worth noting that the vast majority of these murdered or ousted leaders were those that wished to chart an independent economic path for their nations. This has surely sent a message to all would-be third world revolutionaries. Here I'm speaking of Lumumba, Allende, Mozadek, Cabral, Michel, Sankara, Roldos, etc., 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 right up to the present times of Jean-Bertrand Aristide in Haiti. In this context, is South Africa a pariah or a reflection of 21st century civilization. What is the fate of the most impoverished, darkest-skinned humans in India, in Brazil, in Obama's United States, and even here in this United Kingdom? Has the mythology of white superiority and all its attendant abuses vanished into thin air as black humans marched into the promised land on the backs of a media-sanitized Dr. Martin Luther King, a post-imprisonment Mandela, and of course, the White House's smoothest-talking son? Let's focus on the United States briefly. The world policeman and self-appointed captain democracy, along with Britain, of course, a nation with more military bases, more widely dispersed around the globe than any other in history, a nation with more humans in prison than any other, both by ratio and as a percentage, 
a nation with by far the highest murder rate in the developed world and a nation that everyone seems to have forgotten makes a sport of invading such military insignificant threats like Grenada, Haiti and Panama, to say nothing of Iraq or Vietnam. These abuses have occurred against the will of much of the American population and of course against popular opinion globally, so much for the international community. It's in the US prison population that we find perhaps the most depressing internal manifestation of America's racial and class history. Today, the United States of America imprisons a higher percentage of its black population than did South Africa at the height of apartheid. More of these people are locked up for non-violent drug possession offenses than for rape, armed robbery and murder put together. It's beyond the scope of these 15 minutes, but to understand how slavery and its pretend abolition led to convict leasing, then chain gangs, and then logically to today's often privately owned for-profit prison industrial complex, I suggest the works of Michelle Alexander and or Douglas, Douglas Blackman for starters. Their works show clearly that this treatment, along with the continued racial disparities in every major area, housing, healthcare, access to credit, life expectancy, both within the US and globally, are the calculated outcome of a profoundly racist machine, whatever racially neutral language it is dressed in these days. What of Kenneth Chamberlain, Rika Boyd, Romali Graham, Oscar Grant, and the countless other unarmed African Americans executed by law enforcement in Obama's America without making a peep in international news? That is to say nothing of the daily brutality of ghetto living. And here we are, our government, the primary business partner to the Anglo-American empire, feeling rather smug as our relative comfort temporarily shields most of us from the injustices committed in our name. So what can we do? I obviously don't have the answer, but I began speaking about the teaching of history and it's on this point I wish to conclude. Teaching impressionable young minds to idolize murderers, to sanitize revolutionaries, to ignore the contributions of ordinary people like themselves and to worship imperial conquest, as is being done today, is an extraordinarily violent act. We can start here. The way we view and understand past injustices unquestionably colors the way we perceive and thus interact with today's politics. And by exalting the resistance of everyday people instead of colonizers, by making plain the unspeakable brutality of the world, we can push these same young minds to interact, hopefully at least, in ways that are less complicit with injustice. A modest but practical aim that all adults with access to a library and young ears that will listen can partake in. Who knows what fruit it will bear? It always seems impossible until it's done. Thank you.